have your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to read beginning in verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. A brother from South America, a church planter missionary down there, uh, said disciples focus on producing more disciples. Churches focus on producing more churches. Now how do we do that? I believe what he's saying is true. I believe that's scriptural. It's exactly what we ought to do. But how do we do that? You know, churches are made up of disciples, and disciples need the fellowship and support of the local church. We need that. But when we look at ourselves, we are either members of the Church of Philadelphia, the uh, open door church where God has granted them the open door or we're members of the lukewarm church that Jesus threatened to spew out of his mouth that Laodicean church now when I, I look at this I think about what a lot of people do uh, I saw a building uh, this morning that uh, the building was not being changed torn down and, and rebuilt but they were changing the outside facade of the building. It's going to look different, but the building on the inside hasn't changed. And a lot of churches do a change that looks good on the outside, but the inward change doesn't take place. Ephesians uh, 3, verses 14 through 21, is Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church. And let's read that today. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. Ephesians 3 and verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And he, uh, pardon me, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may have, be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, our hearts are drawn to this prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesian church. Our hearts are touched by the prayer request, the intercession that he made on behalf of that church and those people. We pray, Father, that we would also hear what he prayed and pray it ourselves, not only for ourselves, but also for all those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ all around the world that we might be the people that you'd have us to be and that you might get all the glory. Teach us today what you'd have us to know. We pray these things in Jesus' name for his honor and glory. Amen. The body of this prayer, Paul identifies four needs that can only be met by God. The Ephesian church was a good church, but Paul knew that trouble was coming. In Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 31, he warned them, he said, there's going to be grievous wolves come and devour the church. And, and even among from your own selves, there's going to be men who are going to uh, rise up, who are going to draw uh, disciples after themselves and mess up the church. And so he warned them. And then we also know 
that uh, in Re Revelation chapter 2, Ephe the Ephesian church was the first church that Jesus spoke to. And he spoke to them that they had left their first love and warned them to repent and return and do those things which they had done in the past to the glory of his name. So they needed to be prepared not only to face the opposition, but also to prosper in the gospel in spite of the opposition. A lot of people are talking about sort of wringing their hands and saying, you know, uh, we've got all these restrictions and we've got all these things that are happening and, <clears throat> and the Christian message is uh, being silenced right and left. And this has been going on for several years. And that uh, we need to, to fight a political battle to get it to change. <laughs> Folks, the Ephesian church was in the midst of the Roman Empire. They were always under the restrictions and power of the Roman uh, thumb upon them. But they still prospered, and so should we. And we need to prosper in spite of it. We also must face the future with the hope that Paul prayed for those in Ephesus. What do we need to finish the task of Christ's great commission to us as disciples and as churches? Well, let me say right off the bat, we have these four things that Paul prayed intercessively as an intercessory prayer for those in Ephesus. And it's also for us as well. First, we need strength, and we must find our strength through God's Spirit that dwells within us. Being strengthened by the Holy Spirit, that He would grant you to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. In the inner man. You know, we always look on the outside. Uh, I, I can't but laugh every time I think of what um, Ying Kai said when he went off into China. He went to this church and he gave them a lesson on how to spread the gospel and told them what to do and said, go do it this week and I'll be back next week. And when he uh, came back, there was this man that... Uh, led 30 people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in one week. And Yin Kai says, if I were choosing the messenger, I would not have chose that man. He was old, he was ugly, he was hard to understand, but God chose him and empowered him to get those people saved. He later became the pastor of those churches and spread, help spread the gospel through that region of China. We need to understand, Paul's intercessory prayer began with asking God to give strength to them through the Holy Spirit. Victory does not come through wealth, power, or any human agency. It doesn't come that way. We cannot depend upon the flesh. The battle is the Lord's. And according to Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. He knows what he's doing. We need to get in line with his spirit. We need his spirit working in and through us. The second request that Paul had was that Christ must possess us. He uses the word abide, but we need to understand it's not that kind of abiding where he's just there. He's just there. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Dwell in your hearts by faith. Not, that not just live there, but dwell there and to occupy there. We are bought with a price and we are no longer our own according to 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 19. We're bought with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 that we're not our own. We're bought with a price. We have a responsibility not to ourselves or any other person or agency 
we have our responsibility to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that if Jesus is not in you, that you're not one of His. And if that shakes you up, it ought to. I, I, that was my problem. I was religious but lost because I didn't have Jesus. He didn't live in me. He wasn't in, uh, in my life at all. And I knew it. And I'm so glad that He forgave me of my sins and He came and He lives in me today. I'm not His best servant, but I'm His. I belong to Him. And I, I, that's important. If Christ is not in us, then we're not one of His. Romans 8, verse 9. But we are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of His. He is none of His. But not only do we need to see Jesus living in us, we need to yield to Jesus as Lord over every aspect of our life. Every area of our life under the control of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is going to sound strange, but bear with me. Just like a demon-possessed man is possessed and controlled by the demon. Jesus must be allowed to possess and control everything in our lives. There's a prayer I pray, pray every day. Lord, what will you have me to do? What will you have me to do? He is the Lord. That was Paul's prayer, and it's become mine. We all need to ask him to take control of our lives. Jesus must both own us and control us. And then also, we must know and experience the unfathomable love of Christ. Unfathomable. Think of that word for a moment. We need to know that love. Jesus, uh, Paul says in his prayer interceding from the Ephesians, he said that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. It's unknowable. And I know this is a paradox. For how can you know the unfathomable? How can you know it? Think about that. We appreciate the depths of the ocean. And even space. How far, how great it is. We look at the stars. So that we must strive to grasp the great love of Christ. How much does He love us? How much? He loves us to the depths of our sin and to the heights of His resurrection. He loves us. And we can't fully understand that. But every believer in Jesus has experienced that kind of love through the forgiveness and grace found by faith in Christ. We are His, and He has saved us by His grace. Perhaps because we cannot fully know the love of Jesus, we will love and appreciate His love for us even more. can't know it completely, but we ought to strive to. It ought to keep us in awe every day of our lives. Finally, we must be filled with the fullness of God. That ye might be filled with all the fullness of God, he says in verse 19. We are told that Christ is in us the hope of glory. And we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be ye not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we're instructed that God the Father himself in all his fullness must dwell 
in us. Dwell in us. Now I know there's the, this myth out there that God dwells in every human heart. That is a farce. That is a lie. He doesn't dwell in every human heart. He only dwells in the heart of those who put their faith and trust in Jesus. And perhaps John 14, 20 will make it clear. It's one of the verses I, I go to from time to time to understand what it means to have Christ in me. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, ye are in me, and I in you. We're permeated by the presence of the Godhead. The Godhead fills and flows through our lives. Others will see as he does and hear and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's our purpose that he's left us here for. You see, when, when we're saved, we're given a commission. We call it the Great Commission. It's expressed in different ways in all four of the Gospels and in the book of Acts. And in that commission, we are told to go into the world and make disciples, to preach the Gospel to, to everyone. But we need, to, to, uh, we need help because we can't do it in our own strength. Think of what Jesus said to that uh, Philadelphia church. He said that they were the church that he had given an open door. But he, after that, he, he said, you have a little strength and have not denied my name. Now think about that. Isn't that wonderful? They weren't strong. They weren't powerful. They didn't have all the money. But they were faithful. And they were part of his. And they still loved him. And they served him. And they... Jesus gave them an open door. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you this. I believe at this point in time, in this world, we are living in those very last days. I mentioned it last week. We are the runners running the, the baton race, and it's been passed on from one generation to the next, and now we're in that last generation. I'm convinced of it. And if we are, the time is short. And we need to grab, take that baton that's been handed off to us and run our race to the finish line. Because Jesus is coming soon. Amen. And we will no longer be able to tell our friends and relatives, those dearest to us, that it is time for them to repent and put their trust in Jesus so they can go with us. That song by the group Love Song from years ago, and I often quote it, it says, With one hand reach up to Jesus, and with the other hand bring a friend. We are in those times where we can no longer play church. We must be the church. And we must be true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and go forward. Then when it's all said and done, then when everything is finished, God the Father will get all the glory. When I read this, I, this is in my prayer time every day. When I come to this part, I pray like this. And I'm going to go back here to, so I will be clear. I pray like this. Now to you, Father, to you, Father, that who is able to do exceeding abundantly of all that I ask or think, according to your power at work within us. Unto you, Father, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's my prayer. I pray that so that I can get 
the idea into my heart. It also is sincere. I want the Father to get the glory. That he who saved me through the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified on earth as he is in heaven. And we as Christians have for too long thought of everything else but the glory of God. We glorify men. We glorify ourselves. We glorify churches. But it's God the Father that Jesus came to glorify. And we need to begin about the business of doing that. All our labor is for the glory of God the Father. We have nothing in ourselves, but we have someone who dwells within us to do all things to the glory of God. Of God the Father. And it will be to our satisfaction and glory that through Jesus, God the Father will get His due glory in us and in His church. Think on these things. Think on these things. And let God give you wisdom beyond my words to know the greatness of of His love and grace toward us in Christ Jesus. Let me shift for just a moment. I realize to some of you this is alien. This is just, you can't understand it. You don't understand it. And you have no desire to draw near to God because He's not your Father. Could it be that you are still far from God and need to experience His love and forgiveness through Jesus Christ? Could it be that's what the problem is? It was my problem. <laughs> I, it wasn't that I didn't attend enough church, that I wasn't a religious person, but I was religious and lost. And at that time in my life, if I had died, I would have gone to hell. Because I was not His. And what I had to do is what you need to do. To turn from your way and turn in faith to Jesus Christ the Lord. Then Jesus will save you and make you a child of God. Giving you eternal life and forgiveness. And it's not by anything that you do. Though He wants to work and do a lot of things through you. It's by what He has done. On the cross of Calvary, He cried, It is finished. Nothing else has to be done. Jesus paid it all on the cross of Calvary. I owe Him everything. And so do you. Will you put your trust in Jesus Christ? Why not trust Jesus today? Why not do it today? Bye.